Should have been here a day earlier. You could have got in on the jam. Okay, All right, we're live now on Facebook. So I'm just going to kind of pull it up just in case we get some peeps that want to shout a question out to you. There you are. Fuck, where did, who cut your hair, man? I went in on that. <laughs> <laughs> you heard Thank me you making hard. fun of your hair before. Um, it's fresh. Oh, okay. Mine's fresh too, but two weeks ago ain't fresh. You got what? Are you got to cut every week or what? Uh, every three weeks. <laughs> yeah. We're getting real personal now. Yeah. Stuck to like they have. All right, let's get the six ten off here. I don't listen to six ten. It just happened to be on. <laughs> All right, Dave Farrick, I appreciate the time, brother. Thank you, man. Um, pleasure. Thanks I know that coming. you continue to be what I call a political lightning rod. So I appreciate the time coming in, and as you mentioned earlier. We got Sandy and Anziata coming on uh, later in the week. Um, Jim Diodati in July. So, uh, uh, man, there's a lot of issues swirling around the region right now. And, and of course, the local media is just feasting on it. And, you know, I've been guilty of calling the local media out on, dude, what do you think no one wants to come to Niagara for? You guys keep printing all this garbage about pornographic images and like hey yeah well and i'm not making any excuses but and you know the media will say we'll stop doing stupid things and we'll stop reporting them uh -huh. uh, uh, but it, it seems like on all sides i mean right down to bill sawchuk's removal and the seizure and then somebody sits under a hat and it's just wow i mean i couldn't look at local politics until a little while ago and then when I was kind of brought up to speed on the clickiness of it, and at that time it was all liberal. And now you've seen, you know, the conservatives come in and take power back. And now the liberals are pissed, it seems to me, and do anything to get it back. And so, anyways, uh, I don't want to turn this into a monologue. You're my guest. So, Dave Barrick, uh, operations director for the MPCA and uh, elected regional council for the town of Port Colborne. Um, Dude, what's what, what regional issues have got you cranked up these days? And I, I know you're not going to point to probably the HR issues that's making the media these days, but like, Correct. what do you find is on your lips as far as you know when you're talking to constituents? Things that you go directly to is the most important issue in Niagara. Well, okay. So uh, first of all, thanks for having me today. Yeah, you're welcome. I appreciate that. Um, so when I talk about constituents, uh, I'm going to talk about my constituency, and that is in Port Colborne, which which may have a, a different um, uh, lens than certainly you know people in St. Catharines or, or other areas of the region, and that's just the the makeup of the region as a whole. We're a community of communities, and I get elected by the city of, uh, residents of the city of Port Colborne, and uh, I get elected on a platform of keeping property taxes low, uh, job creation, getting Port Colborne's fair share. Uh, accountability and transparency, and working for seniors and young families. In Port Colborne, there's a, a higher uh, uh, proportion of seniors, and there's quite a few young families there as well. Um, I'd say the region has and is delivering on those objectives. There's, uh, I sit on the region as budget chair, and uh, primarily because to fulfill my mandate of why I was elected to keep property taxes low, we had a 1.48% average annual tax increase this term of council and to put that in contrast and i'm going to compare the city of port colbert as an example they are approving their city budget tonight likely approving it at 6.7 percent so their one-year budget if it's approved tonight which looks like it will be is a larger increase than the region in the last four years combined so the 1.4 percent is under inflation it really is a lot of work. That's where I do most of my work is uh, keeping property tax increases low. And again, getting Port Colborne's fair share. So tens of millions of dollars invested into Port Colborne infrastructure uh, over the years as well. So those are the issues that matter to my constituents. Those are the issues that matter to me. Uh, there are some other issues that, as you diplomatically pointed out, uh, nice. matter to other people uh, for other agenda reasons and purposes. And you highlighted, uh, you articulated, you know, kind of a liberals versus conservatives type of construct. 
I would reframe it a little bit more because I think people use a party banner as a bit of a rallying cry and it's just not so. Especially, especially municipally, we are independent legislators. I've been a uh, federal liberal really since 1993, so I kind of grew up under the Jean Chrétien, Paul Martin era. Okay, well, hang on to say that again. You're a liberal? Yes, fe <laughs> federally, federally. Um, okay, federally. And, uh, and I, I still pay my, my dues every month. I was on the Liberal Party uh, okay. executive for our writing association. But it shouldn't be a surprise because, again, as I was saying, um, I, I grew up under the Chrétien Martin era. They um, reduced the debt. They were responsible with, with money. Paul, Paul Martin was a great finance minister, man. Right. So now, when I bring that same value set and I get elected on a platform of respecting taxpayer dollars, automatically people assume I'm conservative. So that's, that's just okay. not so. Par I, I, party politics for me have nothing to play in the mix municipally. Um, you know, when you're talking about roads, you know, pothole issues, party politics don't matter, mm -hmm. with all due respect. No one's calling saying, toe the party line on this one, right? It's, it is uh, individual basis, individual merit system. The concept of what does come in play, though, I would suggest is, uh, and I'm going to frame it as an old guard, people who have been in charge and responsible uh, for the region for a couple of decades. They aren't anymore. And so and they're like, pissed. And so, you know, again, it's, <laughs> oh, my gosh, let's raise the flag of uh, partisanship. Cool. If you look, the cabal, the cabal, it's ridiculous. What was it before when when the several quote unquote liberals were responsible? I uh, wasn't a cabal, maybe. Well, I called it, it was, a clique. Everything was rainbows. No, but... Everything was rainbows and unicorns. <laughs> Give me a break. So, if you look at uh, you know people who are working together independently today, uh, guys like myself, John Maloney, Jim Diodati, Selena Volpatti, uh, Brian Beatty to agree, uh, and, and others, we're all liberals. You can't cast this all into one bucket and say, conservatives, uh, evil, bad thing. Mm. That's not so. Wow. I, I think many people will be um, uh, surprised to hear that. But, hey, I appreciate you uh, and your frankness. So, uh, can you speak to the, um, the public relations disaster that has been the Niagara region lately? I mean, we can point to the media and say you're a little biased or you're a sensationalist, and I think they have been all of that. Uh, but the region has been a shit show. It's been a dumpster fire for a long time, and, and maybe I'm uh, overstepping, uh, exaggerating a little bit. I don't think so, but uh, what do you... I mean, we can talk about quality of candidates. We can talk about code of conduct. What a fucking waste of time that whole exercise was. Um but what, what's your take on the PR disaster that this has been like? This is hurting Niagara. We're making international news in some cases. In other cases, even if it's just Hamilton picking us up, which they rarely do, CHCH, you know, once in a while, if something bad happens, they report on us. Um, do you have any idea what the fix is around the PR disaster that this has been and how we can maybe... Uh, turn the tide on it uh, because this is important to me. Uh, Niagara's a great place to live, but more and more, I think people are throwing their hands up and going, "Fuck this!" Like, I mean, we can we can see all the negative and we can see all the positive. I think you forget about the positive when when the the press is constantly harping on what is perceived as corruption or nepotism or cronyism or whatever it is. Speak to the PR issue that Niagara region faces right now politically. Okay, thanks. So I think the crux of it is a, is a segue from what we were just talking about. There is a friction in Niagara, certainly uh, from a political context of, and I'm going to frame it up as old guard versus new guard, rather than liberals uh, versus conservatives. And so there's, uh, I would suggest uh, networks uh, or factions of new, younger people, uh, more recently elected uh, you know, other people who are interested in getting elected even now um, versus people who have been elected a long time, uh, career politicians, uh, former politicians who just can't let go. 
And so that's the crux of the friction. With that comes long-standing relationships. Uh, they don't disappear overnight. And I'd suggest that the old guard has um, long-standing relationships with certain members of the media. So um, I would suggest that in some cases, uh, political factions commandeered uh, local local uh, uh, reporters or uh, local publications for a specific purpose, and that is to tear down the current administration. So you can get elected one of two ways. You can build yourself up or you can tear someone else down. It's very clear in this case, they are uh, doing their best to, to tear down this administration. This administration is not their enemy. Uh, a successful administration is their enemy because how do you get elected if they're doing so well? And I would suggest that the region's better today than it ever has been. Now, you wouldn't get that reading local publication, but the facts are the facts. When you look at um, unemployment rates today, the economy, um, tax, uh, the taxes, uh, how we've been more responsible with spending, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We want you to look at code of conduct, naval gazing, integrity commissioner, those types of things. Uh, because it's designed to elicit an emotional response. The facts don't matter today like they used to. And uh, those in the press and others with their own agendas, they know that. When you look at social media as well, we have the social media, I guess uh, we were all supposed to be netizens and the world was supposed to be equal and great. And you have misinformation and inf information side by side. So it's up to us more than ever to determine and figure out for ourselves which is which. Um, so it is incumbent on us. We're diluted with all kinds of information, misinformation. Mm -hmm. And I, I know your initial question was about the PR thing. That is not going away. It's there by design. Certainly, it'll still be there until after the next provincial and municipal election. After that, we'll see. If a majority of the old guard candidates get in, it'll be rainbows and unicorns of the region all over again. If a majority of uh, newer people want a continual pathway of uh, change, you know, we're fixing a lot of problems that have been at the region for a long time. We're going bridge is a major problem. Uh, it's still under OPP investigation. Um, there's been other distractions to try to get people to look away from Burgoyne Bridge. Well, we're the ones that started the value for money audit on that forensic audit put in the OPP's hands. We put in place other value for money audits to make sure that public tax dollars are being spent wisely. We've changed systems and processes. Um, recently, I think there was an article talking about some of the turnover of the region. There was more turnover under the previous administration, specifically when Harry Schlang was the CAO and Gary Burroughs was the chair. Um, I think he got rid of over 80, over 80 people and spent $4 million uh, packaging people off. There was a greater turnover than the nurse today. And you don't get that reading the, the local paper. Hmm. Are you in favor of term limits? I know that's not probably something you can, you know, you have to respect the municipal elections act but i mean uh at any level are you do you think the term limits is something that we should look into yeah i, you, I see, get, you spoke about career politicians and i just think yeah, some right. of them have been there for so long and, and <clears throat> maybe effective maybe great people and then you just think wow um it's just like rubber stamping these guys back into office and i'm not sure the motivation and the um the enthusiasm is there that you might get from uh Someone else coming in, taking their place. Well, yeah, so I think two things. One, I'm open to endorsing a, a term limits. I have no problem with that. The, the bigger issue, though, for me is the, again, the career politicians, the ones that are basically full time. So now it's, I rely 100% on an income as a mayor, an MP, an MPP, where I'm considered a full time politician. That's part of the problem. When people's incomes are solely 100% um, that they have to get elected to, to make a living, that's where you see issues arise in terms of saying and doing anything to get elected versus doing the right thing for the public that we serve. It's a little different on a part-time basis. You know, people have, uh, uh, they're not getting elected because they need the income. You look at a counselor in Fort Cobra, I think it's 10 grand a year or something like that. So uh, it's a little bit different, I think. But term limits across the board, sure. How about referenda? 
non-binding plebiscites, I mean, especially municipally, it's a very effective tool to gauge the pulse of the electorate. It was something that, you know, wasn't going to hold the politicians' uh, feet to the fire as far as, you know, uh, following through on it. But at the same time, and I know uh, Petrovsky brought a couple, well, a resolution at least forward that said, I want to ask these questions on the next uh, ballot. Uh, and it, I don't know, got shot down, maybe just because it was Andy Petrowski, or maybe it was just a wholly and completely bad idea. But I, I mean, I looked at it and I went, yeah, hell yeah. I want to know what people think about this, that, this, that. And if it's, you know, even if it's only five questions, it's going to be extraordinarily insightful, I believe. Yeah, that's true. So uh, let's play it out um, where they have done it. And this is a, a big global scale, but Brexit, as an example, was a, was a referendum style. And you look at the other influences that come into play. So it makes a lot of sense um, if you can get proper factual information out to people. And a lot of our conversation so far is the challenges with misinformation. Um, uh, there's a, It's funny, there's a book called Weaponized Lies. I didn't make that term up, but but that's what's out there. Uh, so they're designed to undermine. That's out there every day. So a plebiscite in the world we live in today, and you look at Brexit as an example, and some would use the Donald Trump being elected example of other influences that come into play to shape public opinion so that they're not necessarily making uh, properly factual informed decisions. They can make any decision they want, but the assurance that I'd like to see is uh, that the decisions are based on uh, facts and information. And uh, so the cases so far is that that's not the example. If you put something out there as a plebiscite, get ready for all kinds of um, misinformation being spread around. Now, that's our job as elected officials. It's not up to an uh, individual who's, you know, um, whatever their day job happens to be, raising a family to sit there and do their homework on every issue that comes forward. That's probably why we get elected. We're the ones that have to read the reports. We're the ones that have to weigh the facts and make informed decisions. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. You know, certain cases it might make sense, like directly electing a regional chair. Um, and I think that was one of the items that Councillor Petrowski put forward at the time. That's a uh, foregone conclusion now. The province has decided on their own. We're just going to do it. Mm, um, so that's, that. that's one case. In, in I'm not opposed to the direct election of the chair. I think there's problems with it and there's pros and cons to both. I mean, uh, but this is going to this is going to turn into a huge election with a huge budget, and you're going to have to have deep pockets to run for chair and win. I mean, you're not running from a little town or well, a Fawn Hill. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe you are. I don't know. But it just seems like you you better have really connected friends and really deep pockets to run. What's a budget of a, a regional chair going to go for? I don't know, but. Uh, so I think there's pros and cons to that, but what I hate about it is the is the I'm tired of the province shoving things down our throat. This is what you're going to do, including the creation of the region. Would you support abolish, uh, uh, abolishing this governance body if we had a, a serious, uh, stable plan to uh, provide shared services and sharing group buying, and uh, you know provide water and wastewater and garbage and all the things that, you know, uh, police and maybe even fire. I mean, there's so many things we could put under that umbrella of a, of a, a service provider with a very, you know, small board of directors that just basically rubber stamp things. Maybe, I don't know. Am I living in a dream world or like, I look at the region and I, and I just feel like it seems like, and you could disagree with this and please tell me how I'm off, but I feel like the corruption is so deep, whether it's staff, whether it's hiring practices, whether it's nepotism, cronyism. I mean, they're carving up 10 kilometer pieces of roads into 10 contracts to give to their buddies. Like, I just don't see how you can make this uh, a governance body with any integrity without just completely demolishing it. And I'm not sure, uh, you know, I toyed with a few of my friends who are political only because I won't let them not be. Like when, when they're with me, it's just, that's that's what's on my lips all the time. I asked you, like, what do you talk about? I'm constantly about politics. And I, I just, I tweeted the other day, do you think there's an appetite for a platform of a regional politician to say, 
I'm running on the platform that in two terms, my job won't exist. <laughs> It'd be great running for chair to do that, but I mean. So if I can, here's the challenge with, with that. By the way, I, um, I'm not opposed to certainly having a discussion. It's a discussion that crops up more from people that live in St. Catharines versus, for example, uh, people that may live in Port Coburn or smaller municipalities. Right. The, Do you think the, the smaller people are less concerned about the region as a governance body not, than not the bigger? Not smaller uh, people, but smaller, smaller uh, municipalities. Yeah. Yeah, right. Part of the concern is that, uh, quite frankly, St. Catharines will dominate. St. Catharines does dominate. So our voice won't get heard. And if you look at the Hamilton amalgamation, which occurred, Flamborough, Dundas, Aldershot, uh, Stony Creek, etc., they all had the same concerns. You know, the the bigger municipality is going to take all our resources and we're managing fine and what do you know and you're going to tell us what to do. All the whole argument. The province didn't leave it up to them to figure it out for themselves because quite frankly we would never get unanimous consent to proceed. Mm -hmm. The province just went ahead and did it for Toronto, Sudbury, Hamilton, Ottawa, other areas. Quite frankly, Niagara was on deck. Uh, they were going to do that with Niagara, but then the government changed. And so they left it out and now this government says, you guys figure it out. Well, there's 12, 13 municipalities kind of the region. Uh, it's tough to get them to agree on uh, anything, let alone something as complicated uh, as this. So if people want that, they should petition the province, uh, number one, because the province can do it, uh, rather than look at the self-interest of local municipalities. The other interesting dynamic is there's 12 municipalities, every mayor by virtue of being elected mayor is on regional council. And by the way, not everybody knows that. Do you think the mayor should be on regional council? Wouldn't that be the first step in making it a more democratic institution by getting the big boys out of there that just want nothing but their own backyard? They're not voting in the favor of the people of the region. They're voting for their own backyard every yeah, time. And, and then they start voting in a block too, which even concerns me more. It's not the mayors as individuals. It's the positions. Uh, where you sit is where you stand. So the public expects their respective mayor to get uh, whatever they can from the region for their neck of the woods. That's their job. But to go back to your question about getting a council to agree to dissolve itself, and I talked earlier about this, the, the self-interest of permanent full-time uh, politicians. Yeah, somebody's going to stand income, up and say, I vote to... No one's going to vote themselves out of a job. Not if it's their full-time job. If it's a part-time gig, yeah, I think you could. You, you likely could get um, uh, a majority of the 18. There's 18 part-time, uh, directly elected. There's 12 mayors. Right. There'll be another uh, another added politician soon. Uh, West Lincoln has added a seat. Of course. Which I voted against, by the way, because I'm not in favor of adding more politicians. Stop voting with my conscience. It, it really well, drives me crazy. I try to hate you <laughs> as much as possible. Adding politicians yeah. to problems never solves uh, never solves it. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up. Dual direct when it came. Uh, I mean, I got a list of things that we can talk about of wastes of time and resources. Um, are you a one Niagara guy? You know, uh, I, you know, we talk about, I'm a decentralization guy from my way back in my days as a green party candidate and still subscribe to many of their principles. Um, the, Further, the governance body gets away from the citizen, the ratepayer, where they live, the less interested, the less uh, motivated, and the less um, uh, intelligent that body can be about what the solution for those people can be. I mean, Ottawa is a perfect example. They don't know what's going on in Wayne Fleet so much. I mean, they have an MP that's supposed to keep them up to date, but. In reality, it just doesn't work. So the further they get away, so I've always been a decentralization guy. Uh, when Sensic championed this double direct, I went on 12 agendas in the region, first time ever, to speak against it. And I only had to speak in St. Catharines when they killed it. And man, was that a load off my chest because I didn't really want to have to go around on this dog and pony show of uh -huh. standing against something that I believe would not fix anything and could be the lead uh, wedge for the discussion of, let's just make it one Niagara. Let's do away with the municipalities. We can do it better. We can save money. We all know that's bullshit. You're not going to save a dime. In fact, 
there's decentralization going on all over the province. Many people that have been forced to amalgamate, you know, municipalities, not many, but there's been a few that have de-amalgamated. So um, I don't remember specifically what your position was on the double direct when it came. You must have voted, uh, well, it passed at the region, so it had uh, a majority of uh, support before it went back for the uh, the uh, triple majority. But what's your take on, you know, we're going to save all kinds of money, let's make it a one Niagara, because I think it's, it seems like a popular idea from the uneducated, go, yeah, yeah, let's make it one Niagara, it would be better. But, I mean, if you look at the go non-committal, I mean, there's many people standing up and saying, see, this is what we can do when we work together. Well, see, we were 12 municipalities working together with the region. Uh -huh. So 13 entities that got this done. So what the hell do we need to be one super city for? What's your take on that? So you had a couple of questions there. One was a uh, specific matter that came to the region I, I voted for, uh, dual duty for St. Catharines regional councillors. Right. Um, I am a little more cautious at large, but I don't want to, um, if it's something that St. Catharines wants for their own governance, and that's how it was pitched, by the way, it was, look, it's not going to, it's not going to make dual duty in Niagara Falls or Welland or, you know, let's try and see how it works. So I'm okay with getting it, moving the dial forward, see if you can get the triple majority and have the discussion. Uh, and as you know, the city of St. Catharines who started the discussion ended the discussion, mm -hmm. uh, which I would uh, go, suggest hey, might have been a bit of an irritant for other <laughs> regional councillors uh, at the time. So the the, dual, the issue with the dual duty model is you actually have it today in the mayors. We talked about that. The mm -hmm. mayors are dual duty. The mayors, again, where you sit is where you stand, are by nature of the roles parochial. They have to be. Part-time uh, regional councillors are directly elected to the region, can afford to have a more region view, region-wide view. If you peg them down to, uh, I would suggest a hyper-parochial model of, and because the conversation next was uh, ward-based, mm. uh, which is even worse in terms of where's the interest of the region when you're talking about a specific neighborhood now that they're accountable to, uh, it exacerbates the problem. A lot of it, I think, is, again, we can keep talking in circles amongst ourselves. It won't matter. It's the province's decision. Uh, so people are better off uh, contacting their MPPs or contacting provincial government if they want to see that kind of change, whether it's one region or 12 municipalities. I remember there was a study done back in the 90s, I believe, where they recommended three municipalities, like, basically kind of along the riding, riding boundaries today. There was uh, the Niagara River one, the, well, the Welland Canal Corridor, and then West Niagara. So there, was, there were options presented then, and, and it ended up being status quo. So there seems to be a lot of time and energy spent in uh, looking at options and kicking it around and this and that, and then but we always end up with a status quo because it's the decision-making framework that is the core of the problem. Um, the province has to make a decision. Uh, we will not, it's by design, we will not be able to have that consensus moving forward mm -hmm. uh, because we're again where you sit is where you stand you could look at um following the riding association boundaries or even school board boundaries because then it crosses local municipalities um and then the conversation of not having mayors on like y y would, would you really be able to get local municipalities to agree that their mayor's not on a regional council mm -hmm. would you really get a, re a, a mayor who's a regional councilor to to vote that way. Hmm. Um, so it'd be a lot of work, a lot easier if the province took leadership and made a decision on it. What do you, and you can't say GE or GO, what do you point to as uh, successes on your two, this is your second term on regional council, right? Correct. So what, do you, what are you confident to stand and say, hey, we delivered on this? So again, it because goes there's so many people that say, what, the, what have you guys actually done? And we could say it in St. Catharines as well. It's, you know, it's, you know, and maybe we got a lot done in the last two terms because there was huge infrastructure projects and there were some immediately important things on the agendas. I don't know. I don't, you know, the only thing that really raised my hair was this double direct thing. But mm -hmm. what are you proud to say that you've accomplished at the region as far as, uh, you know, and, you know, you, you talked about economic issues and jobs. And sure, 
people, you know, you've heard this before, you're politicians. So our responsibility is to create a climate that business can flourish in. We don't create jobs at any level of government. And every election that comes out, it's jobs, jobs, jobs. Now taxes, that's a different story in most cases, but we don't create jobs. You know, we can only recruit and do what we can, but uh, I'm interested as to, you know, you, you got to hear it as well. I'm, I'm not an elected official, but you, you must hear, like, what have you guys done for us anyways? Like, what do you do to make your money over there, earn, earn your money? Sure. I'm going to speak uh, on behalf of results, regional results for Port Colborne. I'm not going to speak on behalf of the region as a whole. Um, so, number one, I anticipate leading into the next election, you're going to see a uh, little more information being provided in terms of the record this term. Uh, certainly, we can't rely on local media to get the region's message out. Um, so you'll, you'll likely you'll likely see more of people's records getting into the next election. Uh, again, you mean like a voting record? Or what uh, they've accomplished? The record, yeah, accomplishments. Okay. Uh, kind of like a, a term report okay. of, uh, of factual results that have occurred. Uh, part of it, again, as I highlighted, uh, average... Uh, tax increase, property tax increase of 1.4%, which is below inf inflation, and I would suggest below any other local municipality. Um, the water, wastewater rates, waste management rates kept uh, added around 1% uh, as well. And water bills and pocketbook issues are important, especially if me, like mine, with young families and seniors. Um, that's the primary reason why I got elected, and that's the primary uh, deliverable that I have, and I and I, the results are that I did deliver on that. Uh, the job creation component, again, we don't create jobs, we facilitate. Uh, our economic development office has been overhauled. Uh, we're working better together with local municipalities than ever before. Um, taxes are important. Development charges, industrial waiver on development charges uh, are important. So there's been some process oriented, some policy oriented, some tax changes, development charge waivers, all those things together uh, have, have led uh, Niagara to be more economically prosperous than certainly the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, and the, and the, don't take my word for it, Stats Canada take the, uh, the record is what it is, uh, low, lower unemployment rate, higher uh, growth in terms of permits and development. It's not all the Niagara region uh, government doing. Uh, obviously, global economy has comes into play, the, the GTA corridor swinging down, currency exchange, there's other factors. Mm -hmm. But we're part of all those factors because uh, we could have easily went the other way. Um, getting, for me, Port Coburn's fair share. For Port Coburn, I'd say the South End, generally speaking, has seen a slow erosion of services over time. So it's a different dynamic than maybe St. Catharines, uh, if you can change lenses for a second. Uh, service has been constantly taken away. A lot of them provincial health care, the hospital closure, urgent care, uh, uh, sorry, emergency room closures, threat of hospital closures. Uh, things like that. Um, we've had our police station threatened to be taken away on a regular basis. Mm. So I sit on a police services board and we can go there if you want to. Uh, but one of the first orders of business I had there was leave the Port Coburn police station alone. And so we secured it uh, for certainly this term of council. Um, ambulance shifts in Port Coburn were threatened to be taken away. Uh, so again, I just step in and remind people, look, you shut down our emergency room. And remember the commitment you made when you shut down the emergency room was commitment to increased ambulance care. Well, some people forgot that. It's not all the same players a couple of years later. So to go in and remind them, no, 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 you're not taking services away. Number one, stop the services from bleeding away. Stop the erosion of services. Number two, enhance services. So we've actually enhanced service delivery. We've added more frontline officers when it comes to policing. We've added adi additional shifts in ambulance care when it comes to health care concerns. Um, we've added housing stock, both um, rent geared to income supplements in Fort Colburn and uh, new constructed buildings in Fort Colburn. Um, additional monies through grants that we don't, the region doesn't have to, they're not Oblige or under jurisdiction to do, but we have grant programs, uh, several grant programs uh, to help and facilitate the local area. Uh, over $400,000 into the Port Coburn Marina, um, over about a million dollars into the city owned infrastructure for east side water wastewater development. And on top of that, the regional infrastructure improvements again, tens of millions of dollars into regional infrastructure improvements, water wastewater. Um, 
in, in Port Coburn. Again, those projects maybe don't sound sexy, okay? Water, water lines and wastewater lines. Um, but people have flooding basements, people's water bills uh, going through the roof seemingly. It, it is, that's the reason that of government. Yeah, it's not, it doesn't, you know, catch headlines, you know, it's not fireworks and events and uh, other things, but it's the basic reason of why we exist. So let's do that and do that properly. I'm glad you touched on emergency services in St. Catharine, 60% of our operating budget is fire and police. Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about this remuneration package that was uh, for the chief forced out. Forced out is the media's term. I don't know. Uh, he had an, another term or an option on his contract. You guys didn't seem to want to pick it up as a as a board. Do you do you feel like we have to look at a better way of policing and fire services? And I've got nothing. Hey, I I would never want to be a police officer or a fireman or a medic, a first responder. It's just I just don't have the the temperament or <laughs> not. I don't have the stomach for it. So. I'm all for paying those guys a good wage. But when you look at a $110 million operating budget and 60% of it's fire and police, is that just the way it goes? Or do you feel like we need to take a, a look at, like, who's going to be the guy, the first community to say, you know what? No, you're not getting that that pay raise. You, you know, we will pay, a, you know, in the States, they have volunteer uh, services in some parts and, uh, cops don't get paid nearly as much as they, in the states as they do up here. I think they're you know close <clears> to six figures for the most part. You know, hundred thousand dollar job. Uh -huh. I'm not saying they're not worth it, but at what point do you have? Is any community going to stand up and go, okay, we just can't afford this? So uh, this police board did do that with respect to policing. So I'm not going to touch the the fire service stuff, especially for Porco or for uh, St. Catharines, because I'm just not aware of what's happening in St. Catharines when it comes to their fire service. Uh, but I can speak to the, the police board and the, and, the, and the police service. If you look again, historically, because you can apply history moving forward, uh, the trajectory of where we've been and where we were going, if left unchecked, is a, a path of unsustainability. The police service budget was growing at a rate of two times, in some cases three times that of the Niagara region's budget. Uh, so it was outclipping significantly. You know, it might have been about $80 million um, 10, 15 years ago to $145 million real quick. Uh, the bulk of that is um, salaries, which are pegged to uh, union, uh, association, uh, collective bargaining, which is governed by the province through provincially legislated uh, arbitration, arbitration system. So you talk about the ability to pay. The ability to pay argument's been done over and over and over and over again with little to no success. Why? Because municipalities, police boards, they actually budget for kind of a worst case scenario. And when they go in and they say, we don't have an ability to pay, they say, aha, sure you do. You got it right here. You already have it in the bank, you already have it aside. So we'll take that, thank you very much. Doesn't carry a lot of water, right? The ability to pay argument, not with this current system. The region has acknowledged as a whole that the arbitration system is broken. And there's other political reasons for that, and I would say uh, an alliance between this provincial government and public sector unions. So it's that way and it's that way by design. Keep public sector unions happy so liberal MPPs can get reelected. That's one of the core reasons. What they will tell you, because I've been to Queen's Park and I've talked to various ministers of labors, they say, figure it out amongst yourselves. That's their go-to answer. They're not interested in fixing the issue as it relates to the people that pay the bill. And that's that's you and me and homeowners and property taxpayers. So historical budget increases for, for the police board was in the 2003 to 2006 term was 30% that term. The term after was 18, the term after was 15. This term is 9%. So there's significant and real um, improvement. And I'd say much more sustainable today than, than previously, and the record says that. When you look at arbitrated settlements, they were always in the range of 3 to 4% year over year compounded. This arbitrated settlement is on average under 2%, so they're about 1.9% across the board. Again, if you look at the graph chart, it shows a downward trajectory like this. Part of the, why we were able to do that was 
while we, we did put some money aside, we didn't put the worst case scenario money aside so that they couldn't say, oh, look, you already have it budgeted. But that's probably what they did before. They would, they would raise, ta uh, raise their budget 5%. Arbitrated award will come in at 3.8%. Guess what they do with the change, the difference, the 1.2? They keep it. So I want to be more transparent about where people's money is going um, mm. and actually have, and have credibility in the argument of we just don't have the ability to pay. And so they couldn't point and say, yeah, sure, you've got a budget. Because quite frankly, uh, it wasn't uh, clearly set aside in, in, uh, in, in a pot of money. That, so we've, now that the settlement's come out, we can right the ship again. Um, and that's why you've seen articles about this police deficit. Because it was tied to an arbit arbitrated uh, strategy, which was successful, by the way. And so we did have some money in reserves. And if you look at the region's 2017 year end, we ended with a surplus inclusive of the police deficit. So um, the benefit to, to, to uh, the taxpayers is more sustainable policing services. And by the way, I mentioned earlier, uh, more frontline uh, personnel. We repurposed some uh, positions to put them on the front line and we've added some new positions by putting them on the front line, all well within the uh, better financially managed um, framework. Again, it's about doing better with the resources you have rather than always adding more resources and adding more resources. Programs and services that were important 20 years ago that are still in play, well, maybe there's different priorities today. And, uh, and there are. So it's having those conversations and rolling up the sleeves during that process. The, the uh, arbitrated collective agreement process was a couple of years. A lot of work. Uh, this stuff doesn't happen overnight. So I, I don't know if that kind of answers your question a bit. Mm, a typical politician. Uh, <laughs> um, have you ever leaked a confidential in, in document in, in out of a sense of fairness or democracy for you know to to the media to you know this needs to get out and I'll do because obviously on both sides someone's leaking stuff to local media. I mean I. Someone leaked the bridge report. I happened to get, well, I think it went to the media first because obviously the standard wrote all about it. The, uh, uh, the local well, 610 reported on the standards report. I got my hands on it. I put it out there. And is there still people named in that report that still work at the region? <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm not going to comment on I, that. Okay. Well, okay. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> you ever leaked a confidential document thinking that, you know, this needs to get out there for the sake of the public? Well, let me, let me put it this way. What I find interesting is um, the dual nature with which the whole conversation is viewed. Number one, you have some reporters who openly put in their publication, leak stuff to me. Yeah, I just thought, well, I'm not supposed to see the tweet because I'm, yeah, he, here's I'm blocked, you, but I, yeah. I swear I just saw a Grant Will Flash tweet saying, here's my e email if you want to leak something confidentially. Correct. So here, here's how you do it. Give me the information. Here's how you do it. On the other hand, when he does get something, he tries to elicit a negative response from the people that they should be outraged that something was leaked. So you're encouraging it on the one hand, and then you're, uh, you know, so it suits for you if you get some information but you're going to be quiet about this one or quiet about that. So it becomes very discretionary. Um, so I don't think that's fair to the public necessarily. Um, there are, everyone has a different sense of what's important for whom. But confidentiality is confidentiality, land, legal, labor, etc. cetera. So uh, there will be more news coming forward about an integrity commissioner complaint being filed about this matter. And I'm happy to speak to you further when it, when it comes out later. But it's not up to me to decide. Uh, it's confidential, but it's okay. It doesn't. It's innocuous. It's not going to hurt anybody. Blah blah blah. You times that by thirty-two counselors, and all of a sudden, uh, you don't have anything that's confidential anymore. <laughs> and, and, I, and I kind of suggest that that that's the case today. Uh, you know, we we have staff giving us verbal updates because they don't want to give us anything in writing, email, or hard copy because of what's going on. So. The environment with respect to confidentiality at the region isn't very good today. I'd suggest that there's always been leaks. 
um, both local, municipally, and regionally, they've always been there. Um, maybe what's different is reporters actively um, getting it, putting it on the front page, you know, bragging about how, how they get uh, access to all kinds of information, uh, and then on the other side, trying to smear uh, somebody else for leaking information. Until a judge drags you before, uh, until you get dragged before a judge that says, name your leak. Didn't that just happen in Quebec? <laughs> Getting pressed to rat out on their confidential informants. What a great move that is. That is. Um, you spoke about reserves. Two hundred and fifty plus million in reserves. Correct. That's a fat reserve, man. What? Uh, I, I don't understand at all the economics of it. You're in the budget committee and have been at different levels. What the hell do we need two hundred and fifty million dollars in a rainy day fund? Well, I'm going to add to that. I, we have another hundred and. 40 million or so uh, deferred revenue. If you add reserves plus deferred revenue, it's over $400 million. There's a couple of reasons for that. One, uh, and I've said it before, it's historical overtaxing. Um, so you tax more than you need and you generate these surpluses. Wait a second. You, Did you just say we're overtaxed in Niagara? Historically. Oh, okay. <laughs> regionally, historically. Um, but certainly that's not the case today. Those reserves don't get built up overnight. Those reserves have been built up over a significant period of time, uh, both partly by design, number one, and both partly because of uh, possibly efficiency in operations that relate to surpluses. Two fifty cells, hundred million is a lot of money, but when you compare it to a two billion dollar uh, ten year infrastructure gap, it's not a lot. Um, a lot of that money is water wastewater reserves, so it's off the water bill that you pay it's overbilling versus uh some overbilling yes and historically for sure uh but also partly by design i mean the region and i think the city of st Catharines they added a capital levy on purpose because it's coming we know it's coming we, yeah it's coming massive water issues water wastewater issues you, infrastructure issues anyway you look at um excuse me the region's plans for a new uh water wastewater facility for south niagara falls because it's growing that single project is over 100 million dollars one project but you multiply the um, over 10 years the region's capital requirements it's over two uh, so if you believe in those numbers by the way I've always been a critic of scrutinizing uh, the capital budget the 10-year plan on a go-forward basis so even if you cut that number in half it's still a significant challenge to be grappling with so uh, yeah th that's a lot in reserves but here's a but it's planned to be used and used properly. And it should offset future debenture payments, uh, future tax increases and things like that. But here's what I what I find interesting. The, the critics who uh, weren't happy with what they thought was a perceived year-end deficit coming forward uh, were criticizing the potential financial mismanagement of the region because they thought, there was, they thought there was going to be a deficit. Uh, turns out that it was a surplus, $900,000 surplus on the tax levy, by the way, um, which on a billion dollar budget, it's pretty close. Regional staff have been given awards for accuracy in budgeting uh, in the last couple of years. So when you take it as a whole, it's quite accurate budgeting to actuals. But when it became a surplus, the critics who thought it was a deficit, now what do they do? They change the channel and say, oh my gosh, now the surplus is a problem. The deficit's a problem, the surplus is a problem. Mm -hmm. Well, pick one. It's like the Marshall Gro uh, um, uh, Groucho Marx line. Uh, if you don't like my principles, that's okay. I have others. There's no consistency mm -hmm. in uh, in attacks from, by the way, sometimes the same individual uh, critic. I get they have their own agendas of maybe trying to get elected themselves, but be consistent uh, and have a set of principles. So the, that reserve, I think, uh, you'll see every every year we have discussion about how it gets spent. Yeah. And and if people think that that's a problem, then it's a good problem to have. Uh, let's touch on the uh, <clears throat> news hitting the paper. It's all over the media these days now about uh, HR hiring practices. You, 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 you've taken a few arrows on this one too, about taking a position that wasn't tendered or whatever the not openly competitive for. And uh, now Carmen D'Angelo is kind of in the same boat. You know, leaks, uh, candidate names leaked. Obviously, uh, the 
the image of impropriety stands pretty strong. You know, I don't know if there's a you know a portion of that that the media is not reporting on. I I frankly try and not look at the media because I, I can't stand to read most of it. But you can't get away from it. So what's going on here? I mean, um, there seems to be some serious competition for that CAO position. It seems like the least experienced guy got the job. It looks like it's insider favoritism or whatever you want to, whatever label you want to put on it. But I think this is what drives people mad. One, I think they're a little envious. They're not getting their piece of the sugar. <laughs> to be honest, I think anyone would say, yeah, I want to, I want a plum position that I, you know, didn't work for, uh, didn't deserve, wasn't qualified for. Um, I don't know, Carmen. I don't think I've even shaken his hand. The first time I saw him in person was at the region uh, a couple of weeks ago when they did that art installation, and, and uh, it was really well done. The place was packed. Saw a number of councillors and a chair and what have you, but it was the first time I ever laid eyes on the man. I don't have a, you know, I don't have anything, an axe to grind, but when you look at that, you go, man, this is, and this is what sends me back to this position of, thorough corruption like how do you get around the news of guys are getting good paying jobs without having to really compete against the strongest or competing against it and winning against the strongest qualified candidate so you have a couple of things there and <clears throat> part of what you've just stated uh, is the inference that is being purposely pushed out by design in other words, HR matters, by their very nature, legally, legislatively, are confidential matters. In other words, for you to talk to me about a CEO recruitment process, number one, I wasn't part of, but number two, um, you know what's confidential and I, and I can't speak to it. And reporters, uh, reporters know that. What that does, though, it, it allows a vacuum of information and conspiracy theories to fill the room, fill that void. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit high level, uh, cognizant that I can't, certainly can't talk about details. You mentioned my, uh, my process and I want to be clear, uh, I'm not a spokesperson for the NPCA. It's my day job and I'm an employee there like any other. And I did go through a competitive process for that position, uh, to be clear. Secondly, I got that position January, 2014. And we had a quick chat right before we went live. Um, January 2014. I got elected, re-elected October 2014. No issue, right? Um, so the, so what you're saying, if the electorate had a problem with how you got the job, they wouldn't have re-elected you? To the yeah, post. people were trying to tie the two together at that time. And again, the public doesn't care about that. They care about how their taxes get spent. They care about service delivery. Um, so there's other agendas that will, you know, use, um, and by the way, it's very dangerous and you're going to have to bring me back if I get off a tangent on here for a second. When, uh, people criticize, uh, part-time politicians or anyone who's interested in coming into office for their day jobs. Uh, number one, I've always had a day job. Uh, I originally got elected in 2006 in that time period, about 12 years. I've been a sole proprietor, worked in the private sector, worked in the nonprofit sector, and worked in the public sector. And it's never been a problem, as it shouldn't be for anybody else, until recently. And I'd say because it's a height of a distraction. If people have an issue, not only with me but others, come after me on my record as a elected official, not uh, my day job. And there's other examples, plenty of examples. Cindy Forrester was a nurse. Jim Bradley was a teacher. We have regional staff that are city councillors. We have regional staff that are school board trustees. We have or had other regional councillors who were school board staff. Um, there's city councillors that are teachers. So you have all walks of life on your local uh, elected officials. Private sector, nonprofit sector, public sector, retirees, business owners, etc. That's the way it should be. 
And so to try to tease out or isolate one and make it an exception is just not the case. So I think it's dangerous. I think it's an assault on democracy, quite frankly. When I talk to other people about considering running for local office, they say, why, why do I want to risk my day job for that? Or even business owners, why do I want to risk losing customers for that? Um, it's, and you it's, will. It's becoming, it's becoming a, an issue because the critics aren't going after you for your record as an elected official. They're going after you for uh, a day job in, in a public sector where they know you can't respond. Um, or some other mechanism. And, and, and here's the degree with which it was going. <clears throat> Cindy Forrester, in her um, amendments to change the Conservation Authorities Act, one of her amendments stated that if somebody worked for a conservation authority and they ran for office, they'd have to give up their day job. Now, thankfully, that amendment didn't pass, it failed, mm -hmm. like every uh, one of her other amendments failed. But it's a dangerous road to go down when you start cherry picking who can actively participate in the local democratic process and who can't. So, I, so I'm going to kind of leave that there. Um, the other aspect with respect to the hiring of uh, Carmen as CAO, first of all, the guy's doing a phenomenal job. And for critics who have an issue with, I'm going to call it the administration, so the chair's office, the CEO perhaps, and others, come after the elected officials all day long. But to start going after the staff, it would be unacceptable last term or the term before that. In fact, it was unacceptable previous terms of council. I'm not sure why it's acceptable today, because now the, the attacks you know, we're used to it, I've got thick skin, come after me all, all you want, and people do. It's part of a healthy debate, I think, when you when we challenge each other on, on public matters, what we were elected to do. It's unhealthy when you start going after people when you know they, they can't respond, such as people in their day jobs, uh, like Carmen, like uh, Rob Damboise, like myself in my day job. Um, so it's unfair to them, I think. There was a lot of rumor, innuendo, conspiracy theories published in the article that you referenced. There was a quasi made up kind of silly org chart thing that they put up there in the hard copy paper. What's the HR professional doing commenting on this at all? Well, again, look, uh, this stuff is, is, it just seems like that would be the time for them to shut their mouth, but they just seem to be only too happy to comment. I'm... Yeah. So it, it doesn't help to the overall, um, uh, discussion and look, there will be more discussion this Thursday at regional council. I have no doubt about yeah. that. Yeah. Um, you'd be going for an extension on that curfew for sure. But look, I mean, there was, uh, um, I'm, I'm going to say it's public, that uh, David Oakes is the deputy CEO for the city of St. Catharines. Many would say that was preordained months ago. In fact, that position was uh, created. David, talk about tra trajectory. Was specifically Boys have created a pretty good person. one. <laughs> well, look. Um, Give me clear on this one, though, and we can go back to David if you want. But I mean, I can't, Maybe I, maybe I don't understand it. In, in reference to Carmen. Sits on the NPCA as a member of Hamilton. Takes a leave. Accepts a contract. To create the terms of reference for the CAO's position. And then wins the CAO's position. You don't see a conflict there? Like, how can that not be a conflict? He... So just because I, he stepped off the board, did, was he? Do I have the story right? And then he, well, he gets elected CEO of the NPCA, and then hardly a lateral move over to the region. Like, am, do I have it wrong, or is it? So, I don't know if you have it right or wrong, to be honest, because uh, I don't know if he did do a terms of reference for a CEO or not. I think that's a really good question for the chair of the NPCA uh, versus an. Uh, Again, my role there as a staff person. Mm -hmm. Your situation, similar from the standpoint that you had a relationship with the NPCA before you got your job. You were on the board, right? Correct. Now, Tony Quirk came on the show and said, I got no problem with it. Sometimes the board member that sits beside me or what have you is more in touch than any outsider could be as far as what 
the role of a director of operations might entail. I look at it and go, dude, it's fixed. The guy's on the board. He gets a fat job. I mean, you, you do pretty well as, part, as far as compensation goes. And again, even for a guy like me, I've only come around on you recently because you've stood up for a few things that uh, were very important to me. One, this integrity commissioner thing, you spoke all the right words. I don't think we need a freaking integrity commissioner. In fact, we don't even need a code of conduct. And if the code of conduct does not respect the charter, and that's why I was kind of on Andy's jock as far as I think you're onto something here. Now, he blew it all up, which is, you know, Petrosky's style. I have a belief that the code of conduct should respect freedom of, should respect the charter. And the fact that none of them do in Ontario is a problem. And I thought Andy, with his strange way of getting things done, was onto something that might actually help. And in, in my vision, it was like, okay, if you take this on, you could have a standard code of conduct for the whole province that respects freedom of expression, freedom of religion, and all, everything that all the subsections of the charter guarantee, whether you like the charter or not. Um, but going back to your situation, again, it, you know, I've come around on you only because I think we share some political, um, I don't know, we, I disagree with you on a lot of stuff too, but when it, when it mattered, I seem to be agreeing with the uh, Bart Maves. Jim Fannin agrees with the Bart Mays, but I mean, you can't find a process issue that he's not educated. Like he knows more than everyone in the room when it comes to a point of order, mm -hmm. usually. I look at Tim Rigby <clears throat> and God bless him. I love Tim, Tim Rigby. How long has he been there? He's still standing up and going, oh, what's going on? Like, I, I don't mean that to, you know, as a personal attack on him, but I, I'm like, Tim, You've been there for how many decades and you still don't know how to speak to a resolution? And so I came from the camp, man. I've had the, you know, I put the the Pee Wee Herman blasts out there, of, you know, regarding, you know, I don't know. You know, it, it doesn't go unnoticed when you're an asshole. And I have been one many times. I still am. Uh, but I'm passionate. I care. I don't run in these elections just to get my name in the paper. I actually think I'm doing a service. And then... It's easy to hate on a guy that you think is uh, is accepting privilege. And man, that's a dirty word these days too. But he, and I think it it's it, it comes from a an honest, if most people are honest, of I want my piece. I want my plum position. I want my little piece of graft or whatever it is. And so I think it's easy to to hate on from a distance, and I've come around on you again. We've never today's the first time we've met. Right. You know, I've we've kind of Facebooked here and there, and you know, I'll, I'll shoot you a message during council one Which time. Which I appreciate. <laughs> Don't pick your nose on camera. It's not I good for folks. Yeah, to be clear, I <laughs> no, but I, I did. I think I sent you that message. <laughs> you Don't did. do it. Did. <laughs> go knuckle deep, man, because I'll catch you. Don't make me watch this stuff because I have to watch it. I have to know what's going on. I have to know what these guys, which way they're voting. And stuff like that. So I was a hater, a hardcore hater. And you've got a few of them. And you're right, probably from the standpoint that you keep get, getting elected. You're always going to have haters. You're going to always have the press that takes the sensationalist angle. But how, like, and I can't speak to Carmen's appointment or whatever you call it. You're appointed as well. So how do you take something that you're intimately knowledgeable about? You got an inside track. You might even know someone on the hiring committee. You you know, it doesn't take much of a wink or a nod or an elbow in the ribs to go, dude, I'm your guy. Hire me. And we'll, we can all be friends again. Yeah, so let's uh, you know, back up to the process side of things for a second. Um, being an individual who has experience on a particular board that is applying for a role in that organization happens all the time. And it can, and they do, and people get hired regularly. I think you don't see that as a conflict. No, wait a second. Uh, so it happen, it happens often, because process wise, it's uh, allowed and it's applied, and there's value. Values in the eye of the beholder. If they think your experience on a board um, adds value to what may apply in the in the job within the organization, versus mm -hmm. someone who doesn't even know. What, 
in this case, conservation authority is what a watershed is, what restoration means. Um, so to be clear, my background is uh, degree is public administration. And so I have other uh, examples of experience from a, pl a public administrative framework. I also have a private sector background um, with startups and commercial properties and uh, et cetera. So number one, I followed, although there was no policy in place at the MPC at the time, I followed best practice and best policy. By the way, there's a policy today on it and the policy today I would have followed. I believe it was the uh, the former chair of the Hamilton Conservation Authority got elected to be their CAO. Uh, sorry, selected to be their CAO. Wow. So that, it that, happens. Yeah, that that I, that blows my mind. That because, that's not a... well, you can't you can't discriminate. You can't say, Jim, you can't even apply to this job because you're on the board. There's no rule that says that. So but, what but, you what you should do though, and what I did, is you take a leave of absence from the board when you make the application. If you don't get the job, you're back on the board. And because it's HR confidential matter, you really shouldn't be telling the public and the world, hey, I applied for this job and then oh, I'm back on the board because I didn't get that job. Mm -hmm. But you do have that, that process that's in play. And so if you do get the job, you resign from the board. And that's, that's what happened. In this case, um, the, the people responsible for hiring saw value in the experience um, the experiences that I brought to the table and I think everything that that entails. Um, so people may disagree and they do, but that doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with the process. Well, I appreciate um, your comments on that. I, 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 I don't know how it can't be a conflict of interest and, and especially when whatever at the code of conduct or whatever it is that you signed says, you're not allowed to, by sitting on this board or sitting at this council, you are not allowed to receive any personal gratification, for lack of a better word, or any, you know, benefit from sitting here. And, you know, I used the example of the, the chair being uh, hired as CEO. Well, that's that's a benefit, clear and present. So I, I'm not sure. And, and Tony made the same point. And, you know, this isn't my, ex my field of expertise, certainly. I'm just talking about how the public looks at it and goes, hey, that's not cool. He's on the board. Then he gets hired at the, like, that's inside job, you know? And so, um, and again, again, there's people that have their own, um, agendas that fan that flame. There's no doubt. Mm -hmm. Um, and I can tell you, I've had, I've had other offers around that time and I've had other offers since then, uh, that, uh, would pull me away from the position that I'm in. The reason I took it and the reason I, uh, I'm still there now is because of the um, my passion for public administration and um, working on behalf of the, the public and the taxpayer versus purely private sector and the goal is make money. Mm -hmm. uh, the goal in public administration is a little different and it's service delivery on behalf of uh, the public. So we made a lot of improvements in that organization and that was one of the reasons that I was brought on. And part of it is making our parks profitable, putting them in the black. They were all being subsidized. They were all in the red. Um, and so you see recently that uh, the board in their wisdom has had the ability to have a 5% budget reduction. Well, you don't have that ability unless there's other things happening internally that allow those options to come to the table. So uh, again, people can agree and disagree with HR Pro. And this one, by the way, is about five years ago. And I would suggest the only reason people are talking about it is because of my other hat uh, as an elected official. Um, again, regional employees who are city councilors, um, regional employees who are school board trustees, um, this is not uncommon. If you look across the province, other people who are other boards have gotten day jobs within those organizations. Um, it may be a flashpoint and people fanning the flames on it, and I'm fine with the discussion on a high level. The issue is I um, I can't get into detail about uh, my day job because of the confidentiality of certainly the hiring process, number one. And the province's um, Information and Privacy Protection Act uh, legislation exists for that type of thing. So, in other words, if we were to have a fulsome conversation about my whole resume um, or someone else's or Carmen's, 
there's privacy protection legislation. Mm -hmm. And the unfortunate part, again, is um, it allows other people to fill the void with conspiracy theories and things like that. Yeah. Again, I don't want to beat this to death, and I appreciate your your take on it. Um, I don't claim to have all the answers. In fact, I think that's a pretty dangerous stand to take is like, yeah, that's my way or whatever. But I just, you know, you, you talk about taking a leave. Um, I still see the potential, in fact, the implied conflict of having a relationship and having the phone numbers of all your fellow board members and possibly the hiring committee and saying, dude, I stepped off. <laughs> I've applied for the job. I'd really appreciate your support on this. You know, that's, you know, the backroom dealing that nobody wants to deal with. And, and most of the public, I think, would, would sit back and, you know, whether it's a personal attack or going after somebody that's, you know, obviously can't speak to it because of their employment would, would look back and go, hey, that doesn't that doesn't smell my stink test or that doesn't pass my stink test type of thing, you know. So, um, you know, whether or not you take time off the board and I know Carmen did as well and you, you did when you when you saw that position and and uh, but the reality is there's a relationship there and there's uh, there's, you know, the potential or at least it looks like you certainly could be saying, hey, seatmate beside me. I want your support. I want this job. Make sure I get it, you know, and for that guy to say, yeah, I work with you. I know you to be a decent guy. You certainly know the ins and outs of the the job position. Yeah, I'll put you in that position and feel good about it and not ever second guess their potential conflict when the public goes, oh, yeah, that's total conflict, you know, whether or not it happens yeah, on a regular so basis or not. The CAO, the CAO makes the hiring decisions, right? And so, you know, there's a lot of inferences. And again, I'd suggest conspiracy theories and, um, you know, the cabal type um, mystique that has been purposely created around this type of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, public administration is public administration. People can disagree all day long, and they do, but that doesn't mean there's something wrong with the process. And I'm going to keep repeating that because mm. um, when people disagree, they attack the person. They make up conspiracy theories. There's nothing wrong with the process. The same process has been in play, you know, for the last 40 years or more. Um, so, trying to get to the crux of your question. Nobody I hear, was I complaining you, when uh, the appointees and all the jobs are going to the liberals. <laughs> well, I... <laughs> and that's, when I started paying attention to local politics, all the people in power, all the staff members were all liberal appointees or liberal, liberal hires, what have you. Um, talk to me a little bit about... Um, where did this to change in, or maybe I'm off here, correct me if I am, the change in mandate for the NPC become pro-business and not cons conservation? I mean, it's Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority, not the Niagara Peninsula Pro-Development Authority. And, and we can talk about thundering waters and stuff like that, but so, when did this switch and where did that mandate come? Who, who I, put I'm going to give you the bureaucratic answer because I'm a staff person. Right, right. okay. Uh, so we follow the legislation. However, individuals want to interpret it. Individuals can interpret it. We follow the legislation. And I would suggest you ask that question to the NPC chair who's coming later on. But He's I, very savvy as well. Oh, more so. More so. <laughs> more so. Yeah. He's a regular on, on, the, on the radio, so he, he'll be... Uh, oh, yeah, and he runs his expenses right down to the taxpayer to drive to CFRB, that snake. It's great, it's great publicity for, for Niagara. I agree completely. Do you know how much advertising costs on CFRB? No, I and don't I cannot numbers, but... believe that I'm not a Sandy Annunziata honk. Far from it. I like Sandy. I will give you that, but... I have all kinds of political differences with people, and I appreciate a guy like Sandy, and maybe you, where I can say, you know what, I couldn't, but I still I still appreciate who you are as a human being, as a man, uh, not to be sexist, but like, you know, uh, I'm a guy's guy, and Sandy is certainly a guy's guy. Man, um, can you speak to this latest news item about the Niagara River? I guess maybe not because you're a staffer. Or oh, yeah, what do you, yeah. what do you so know about that? Yeah, that's a, a NPC chair question because yeah, that's, okay. that is a board, that is 100% a board um, prerogative. Okay. Yeah. And what was, 
It was the designation that this uh, volunteer group was looking for? Uh, I believe so. Okay. Sorry, I'm not really so helping stick you with that. To, <laughs> um, stick to the regional issues. Got it. Um, chair issue. I guess um, the lawsuit of Ed Smith from the NPCA is a chair issue as well. Yes. Okay. Yes, especially in a legal <laughs> matter. Yeah. Um, what, do, what do you think the, seek, uh, the small steps? Accountability? Or do we have it? You know, I don't, I don't, I can't stand here and have you answer every question by saying there's systematic corruption in the media and it's a, it's a conspiracy against the new regime. Uh, that gets tired as an answer and I'm saying that, that you're using that answer for everything, but. Yeah, to be clear, I don't believe I use that answer for anything. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pulling a Kathy Newman on him. Yeah, yeah, so what you're saying is, <laughs> I think I hear a common theme with um, some of your answers as to you know it's it's not political left and right it's old versus new um i think there's a lot of people that are tired of political answers and they want more accountability well um i don't think you get accountability from codes of conduct i don't think you get accountability with integrity commissioners and think i th in fact i think they've been used as nothing but a political tool and will continue to be used as such and uh -huh fucking waste of time your accountability ends at the ballot box i guess 100 percent. but how i mean i have a problem with some of the quality of candidates as well that we attract and you know there's no silver bullet fix for that either do you have any ideas on thoughts or actions even small or not that we can take to get the electorate or the ratepayer more importantly because we're not all voters. <laughs> we know that for sure, especially municipally. To at least give us the sense that we have some accountability over our politicians, not, and I'm fine with the ultimate accountability being the, being the ballot box. If, if I've done something criminal, fine. We know what the procedure is for that. Uh, any ideas on what we can do to at least create the image of a more accountable process or governance? Well, okay, first, here's, let's start provincially, right? When Whenever you talk about, you know, the, the, the gas plant issue and orange and those other provincial issues, and the public demand greater accountability of the province, here's what they do. They turn around and say, okay, we passed additional legislation, um, but for municipalities. And so you see, Factually, more accountability today on municipalities than ever before. But not a lot's changed provincially. So whenever there's an issue, they say, "Okay, we're going to make, we're going to strengthen this and strengthen that and make this more accountable." But it's a it's a municipal blanket, or a creation of additional buffers like LINs and things like that. Um, so there's more led provincial legislation in place today on municipalities to ensure the accountability that you're talking about. Um, everyone's going to be required to have an integrity commissioner, whether a municipality wants one or not. Niagara happened to... Under what? Uh, under provincial legislation. Municipal Act, I believe. They revised it. Oh, and they put integrity commissioners mandatory in there now? Every municipality is going to have to have one. Okay, because they don't now. They don't need a code or an integrity commissioner at the moment, right? No, but it's coming. Okay. Niagara is ahead. We're ahead of the curve, so... Um, well, it's coming unless there's a new regime in Queens Park. I think it's passed. I oh, okay. It's passed. All right. Um, so that day is gone. That... Yeah. So so those accountability mechanisms are in legislation now to be applied um, locally. I agree with you that the conversations around integrity commission complaints, code of conduct complaints, um, counselor's expenses, these things, while important, have dominated the front page uh, news cycle rather than, you know, Canada Summer Games, GE, um, housing issues, uh, other service delivery issues, um, which makes it unfortunate because having these certain complaint mechanisms in place, and I and I said it before many times uh, publicly over and over again because I was opposed originally, as you may recall, uh, that they become political uh, weapons, and you see that that's that's kind of been been the case, where somebody who may have an interest in running, 
uh, they just file complaints against the candidate because they want to tear that candidate down a notch versus uh, what's actually right for what we should be paying attention to. And what we've noticed is, <clears throat> excuse me, we're spending a lot of time at council meetings talking about those, those navel gazing issues. And the problem with that is what we're not talking about. Mm. Uh, I have a particular opioid epidemic. Well, yeah, right. Or even emergency it, response time, public the, housing for yeah, low there's, income there's people. A, there's a list. There's, there's a list of why people <laughs> yeah, actually I'll get go elected. to the bottom of the list when we start talking about expenses and uh, integrity complaints. That's right. So you nailed it. Thanks. There's that list that you said it could add to it of why people got elected, issues that they uh, are asked to look at and resolve and address. And when you have this distraction over here, you're not talking about those things. The particular irritant for me is. I believe it was we were passing the regional budget at full council that night and we spent most of our time on you know personal issues and very little to no conversation on approving the budget over a billion dollar budget almost no conversation at that meeting uh that's a problem for me because and i said it at council i didn't get elected to police other councillors like you said their their time will come with their constituents at their ballot box not up to me to approve, approve or disapprove of what a St. Catharines councillor is doing or not doing. Um, I'm there to do a job that I've been elected to do. My residents will uh, judge me at the ballot box and someone else's residents will judge them at the ballot box, not me to go after hmm. somebody from St. Catharines, for, or as an example. Yeah. So do you feel like you should be able to do and say anything you want as long as you don't break the law as a regional councillor? Where, where, where do you fall on this 24 hours you're always a regional councillor? Well, yeah, so... I think the argument the, the was religious from the standpoint that I can't go hand out Jehovah Witness, you know, pamphlets if that's my religion because I'm on duty as a counselor. Like, I, I mean, I'm, I don't, I don't know where I fall on it. I, I'm kind of, I, I'm, a, I'm strongly in favor of freedom of speech and self-expression and freedom to assemble and freedom to pray in public if I want. Yeah, they, so the accountability rests with the uh, electors. What we're seeing is a change now of complaints being filed, recommendations to council of how to deal with a particular complaint about a particular councillor. That's shifted the accountability framework away from the elector to uh, 31 or 32 other individuals around the table. So now um, I'm accountable to the people around the horseshoe at the region? I don't think so. Personally, I, my view is I'm accountable to the people that elected me. Mm -hmm. In other words, I mean, you talked about earlier, well, people that you're sitting beside uh, at a board or a council, if you've got a complaint filed against you, you're going to be doing the wake, wake and nudge and, and arms like, mm -hmm. so it's somebody's buddy and they're going to make excuses. Um, so it shifts the accountability away from the electorate, which I'm never in favor of. This whole process of the integrity commissioner, I just cannot, I cannot get down with. Um, and I only know it because I watched pretty closely a couple of these complaints. There can be a, a decision rendered from this integrity commissioner. One of which, did he stand up and say he's retired and got no insurance? <laughs> he... <laughs> Unbelievable! I tweeted that one out too. I was like, I, I, I can't. You're retired. You don't need to have practice insurance if you're retired. But you're, you're the integrity commissioner for crying out loud. You don't need insurance. Um, to think that there can be a complaint made anonymously, and I think Pelham skirted this. The council was responsible for a complaint. That's not provided for under the terms and conditions of who can make complaints. Has to be another member of council, uh -huh. a member of the pub, not a whole body, but they right. got away with it. No one called them on it. Or if they did, nobody cared to say, hey, this isn't allowed. Maybe right. Andy Petrowski was the only one screaming <clears throat> that he, you know, good old plastic face didn't, you know, had his cha his chamber essentially launch of, so anonymously complain. You don't, get access to the complaint how can you defend yourself against something that's not defined the accuser you never get to face all jurisprudence is thrown out the window this is the human rights tribunal on steroids mm -hmm. like this is well, well nothing's worse than the human rights tribunal man i've been grown to loathe that institution uh 
almost no one loses there. You know, I mean, we've had some silly things go before the Human Rights Tribunal. So, but then as I dug into the process and kind of watched it, there's not even an official notice that has to go out. Like you would think in the code or, you know, under here's how you make a complaint, part of the parameters would say the complainant, is that what you call the person that's being complained about? No. Uh, the the, the offender yeah. has to be notified that there's a complaint via register mail. You can't just fire off a phone call and leave a message or fire an email and think that the person, you know, even if he doesn't want to respond, whatever. Can you, can I at least have a registered? Yes, this guy has a registered mail. Someone signed for it. He knows there's a complaint, and here's his time to come. No, the the complaint comes in. If you don't answer the the integrity commissioner's uh, you know request for information or an interview, which in some cases never happens, mm -hmm. you get a decision from anonymous complainant about something you never were able to speak to. And you can you can have your life and your career ruined over something that's just simply undemocratic. There's no, there's no there's no good that can come from that. So I just wonder how anyone with a democratic bone in their body can stand for an integrity commissioner or a code of conduct that's being used in this fashion and is just open to that. Yeah. So I think the experiences that you're speaking about. <clears throat> excuse me, at the regional level, where they're, they've been trying to figure it out ahead of the legislation that's come forward. They've had different integrity commissioners with different interpretations and different interpretations on process. So, again, it hasn't been helpful. I, the region would have been, first of all, I voted against it. It'd be clear about that over and over The again. integrity commissioner? Yeah. Yeah, having one at all. Having one at well, all. Well, it can be left to Chair Kaslan's office, can't it? It, was, it could have. Yeah, yeah, it could have, certainly. Um but anyway, that it, that it's in place, and and you know, I move along. That, that was the decision of council. That's fine. Mm -hmm. um, so you have some of those uh, discrepancies, complaint by complaint, etc. I'm hoping now that the level is playing field has been set by the province. These are the rules. You won't have that much discretion. I understand now that the complainant's name would, the person who makes the files the complaint, has to be identified. Will be identified. Um, and uh, my concern about being as a political weapon, not this term, but next term, they will have uh, kind of a cooling off period where you wouldn't be able to file an integrity commissioner complaint in an election year, like May 1st with the election. Mm -hmm. So that does go uh, to assist. How about a fee? The fee, uh, I think, you know what, they might, I don't know if there's a fee or $5 or something like that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know if there's a fee or not. If there is, it would be nominal. Mm -hmm. But uh, so the integrity commissioner, whoever it is, would view your complaint, and they would first off decide, okay, are we going to proceed or not? They could just rule it out, which they have. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so it's an added layer of bureaucracy. Um, it's an added expense. Um, to your point, where's the value? At the end of the day, you get a report uh, with a recommendation for council's consideration about another counselor. It may have absolutely nothing to do with what the complaint was about, uh, and I'm going to use the Councillor Petrowski uh, examples. There are people, let's be honest, on regional council that just don't like Andy, and so they're not. Can't imagine. They're <laughs> so, so they're not basing a vote or decision on necessarily the merits of what's in the report. If Andy runs again, he gets elected again. I just he had integrity com complaints before before him, and he got reelected. Now he said he's not running. Are you running? Uh, I'm, I haven't decided yet. Such a typical problem. answer, but I'm going to wait till after the provincial. Election. I know you're going to talk to your wife and kids, and you know. Yeah, you know, <laughs> and, but it's important to highlight, <clears throat> and and I say this as a fact. I'm not because I, I, I don't see I mean. you. I see you pretty much as a guy that's. Just, I mean, you stand on your principles. I don't see electioneering coming out of you much. I do see electioneering out of a few councillors that I don't really need to get into yet, and you know, for that matter. I've targeted my interviews to be guys that I don't agree with, guys that I was in the camp of hating on. And I think I'm pretty good at going, okay, well, wait a second. 
Why, why don't I like this guy? Because he's good looking, because he, he's got a good job, and I am not, and I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. <laughs> um, Quirk, Petrowski, Lightning Rods. Okay, so I kind of go for those guys. But the leftist-leaning old guard people have not been receptive to coming and sitting here talking to me. Oh, that's it. See, I wouldn't know that. I don't know who else you've asked. There. They get the same conversation. It's not like, you know, if, if there's anyone that should be easy to go after, it should be a Dave Barrick, right? I mean, we, we talked about some of the issues. You feel differently than I do. But, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not going to get in a fist fight over it with you. Um, but it seems like you guys, to kind of vote together and sometimes see some issues the same way, I've only been too happy to come on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not going to say, uh, you know, Tony answered all my questions the way I wanted to. But he's, a, he's, again, experienced politician with some knowledge and some insight. And he, sometimes he sets me right by going, oh, no. But, you know, and he did kind of make that same point. It happens all the time. Like, really? Well, that sucks <laughs> because it looks bad. So Mike Britton, come on, you know. Again, it's, you know, I'm not putting you guys all in the same camp. Bob Gale sat here, mm -hmm. Petrowski, um, and you guys have been only too generous. Now, it took a while to get you and Annunziata to commit, and Sandy's coming on later in the week. Um, they're not afraid to come and talk about, like, you guys aren't cower, cowering out and, cower, you know, being a coward as far as, like, I'm going to ask some tough questions. Everyone should expect that it's not going to be a love in right Correct. here. I care about my my politics. I can't look away. I I, I suffer an, a, a political addiction of some sort. And yeah, you know, I mean, you don't run. I don't know how many elections I've run in. Uh, none ever with the chance of winning. So I feel like I can make a difference just by I don't know educating people or saying, you know, oh, I didn't know this proportional representation was used all over the world except Canada and the U.S. Mm -hmm. So I care, and that's why I run. You know. Um, but I, I just, um, I, I'm surprised that the other side hasn't said, hey, get me on that show. And I've asked, hey, they're on right now, some of these people that that have a heart on for you. And you see the tweets and you see the post. And Tony Quirk, give him credit. I mean, he, he, he won't, he answers everyone on Facebook. And I'm not saying his word is gospel, but at least he's accessible. Mm -hmm. He doesn't shy away from anyone. He's not, I don't know that he's out there blocking people from looking at him or what have you. Uh, the media certainly is. I think he gets some experience there. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't have access to these guys in that way. And Mayor Dave, you're my latest. Today, I said, hey, I got Barrick today. I got Sandy Thursday. I'm sure they're going to say something that you want to rebut. Maybe it's time you come on the show. And I'm not, hey, hey Dave, nothing against Dave. Um, maybe he will get back to me. Uh, I sent him a Facebook message. He hasn't got back to me. <laughs> you may find getting close to the election, they may uh, be more open to sitting here and having a chat with you. Oh, well, that's a good point. You may find that. Um, but just the conversation about um, maybe groups of individuals who are like minded, I'll put it that way. When I, first ran in emergency council in 2006 a lot of that council at the time was voted the same on almost every issue all the time in other words there was little to no conversation about reports or anything like that so you, you step it up to an organization like the niagara region it is I, i'm going to try to choose my words carefully i don't think i have to but i'm going to say <laughs> undemocratic to think that there's going to be 31 soon to be 32 people around a horseshoe who are going to rubber stamp everything, not say anything, not debate anything, uh, just show up, vote, 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 and leave. That is not democracy. Uh, so you, we have, I think, a healthy friction uh, at, at our council table. The unhealthy part of it comes in when we start to talk about personalities instead of the issues. Amen. Um, so I'm, and unfortunately, the silly season is going to probably get worse uh, leading to the election. But look, there's nothing wrong with the uh, open debate uh, about issues that matter to the public. Um, and I talked before about um, 
you know, social media and online. And uh, because of the way that um, uh, it's structured, that the more, I'm going to say because you, you ran for the Green Party, so the more material you're looking at from the Green Party, the more like similar material you're going to be getting. Confirmation bias. So it's just it just continues to polarize, mm -hmm. right? And so let's say Andy Chelsea's looking at other information. So it just confirms, like you said. Uh, so these the discussion you and I are having right now, we should be encouraging. Uh, yeah. Amongst. Uh, Have others. you ever been turned? Can you think of something that you've been turned on, dude? I'm I'm red pilling right now. I've come so far right because the left just doesn't stand for what I believe in anymore. Free speech. I mean, there's so many policies that the left has implemented, especially provincially. I, I just can't get behind a uh, green party. I'm still, you know, most of their policies still make sense to me. Tax pollution, tax sickness, duh. I mean, um, but there are a couple things that, you know, I, I can't get behind anymore. When's the last time you can remember sitting with somebody and go, okay, man, uh, with this new information, I feel like I'm, I'm changing my, you know, the, the wind is blowing my sails in a different direction. And I'm actually, I'm coming around on it. I know, uh, because, I think that's an example of open-mindedness and something that's healthy for an elected <clears throat> politician that's just not cemented in their position and they can say, hey, I changed my mind. Sue me. Like, I changed my mind. Some new facts. I've learned something about the issue and I've changed my mind. The last time you can remember Okay, so for me, I, I, I think uh, the development charge issue, which would have uh, been the last time I was in favor of development charges, growth pays for growth, et cetera, et cetera. We talk about the waivers and the benefits of. You're in favor of waiving them? No, I originally I was in favor of keeping them, maintaining them. Okay. Um, then, then you waive them. Yeah, but you know, in to your point, getting that information, right? Learning from experiences, having a waiver, which was going to be an interim basis, uh, so that helps. Um, we've decided to extend it, but uh, no. Look, hang on a second. You didn't. Isn't that going before the OMB? Oh, the current one? Uh, yeah. So I don't know the, where the region is at now with, I believe, Welland are still right. having conversations. So I don't know if it's going to go there or not. Okay. Can, um, can you back up and just tell me a little bit about the development and how that played out? Because I don't know if I've got the whole story. So let me be more specific. Um, the industrial development charge waiver. Okay. The right. stuff that Welland's talking about is... Okay. Uh, other, I actually voted against... The issue you're talking about, I voted against. Right, I got you. Because uh, because of the uh, uh, in significant increase based on a capital project list that I thought was unrealistic. Um, but just to answer your question about being open minded and doing the diligence. Right. And Thank research. you for the question. No, no, that's okay. I have to go back. <laughs> Creaming <laughs> off. <laughs> um, here's what. So again, I I studied the political science and public administration. Uh, in my university days. That's frustrating too. Here's, yeah. here's what they never teach you. Um, it's uh, so much of it is personality based in terms of this decision making, right? So I'm going to use the Councilor Petrowski example because we have a couple of times. Andy has some great ideas sometimes. And it doesn't matter to other people. It's the fact that it came from Andy, they mm -hmm. were turned down. That's the old Democrat time. Republican thing in the States, for sure. Yeah, and we've so, seen that. It, but that's a microcosm example, but it, it's across the board. And if it's, you know, you and I disagree on one thing and I vote one thing, you vote the other, well, that's it. You you will never vote for anything mm -hmm. uh, that I bring forward ever again. The line's been drawn. There are, there are people around our council today that that's their mind set and framework. Uh, so they don't necessarily do. It shows up on the voting screen. You don't need to be a genius <laughs> to figure out who doesn't vote which way. Yeah. So I'd say, look, I'm the youngest councillor, again, this term at the region. I was youngest at the city, youngest at the region last term this term. It's starting to become a problem. I'm 39 years old. There's no wonder they coming out of the woodwork, which is extremely disappointing. And I would suggest that my generation and those younger than me really don't care where the idea is coming from, no. it's about the idea. So I'm going to go back about to the... mankind, humankind, yeah. down the road together Great to a better place. Yeah. So it's less about it's less about uh, personality issues, I, I think, um, than it is about the issues. So part of that, let me talk about it at the beginning of this uh, segment. People who maybe be there too long, where it's only become about personalities. It's not 
about DE ideas and uh, continuous improvement and things like that. So there's that dynamic that's at play around the table for sure. What's the rationale to, to get McGuire out with a fat payoff and see him down the road? Can you speak to that? Uh, so. Is it I'm gonna, ideological? I'm gonna, here's what I can speak about. There's a retirement agreement that this board has decided to make public. So his original um, hiring contract is online. His amended contract, that's the amendment where they extended his contract for three years. Were you on the board for both of them? No, sir. Okay. And then there's his retirement agreement. So all those agreements are online. It's put on there. People can see it for themselves if they want. I can't talk about the conversation piece around it, uh, except that it was an agreement, a retirement agreement. Um, so what I can talk about is the current chief realizing uh, over $8,000 in savings almost immediately, as well as uh, certain improvements um, in service delivery, et cetera, um, after, uh, after the fact. So I think what you're hearing out there is a bit of an interest, and by the other, I'm going to say CAOs um, have uh, had similar type of agreements because it happens in the public sector and in the private sector. I mean, there's uh, labor laws, uh, for that type of thing. but if you, especially at a CAO level or uh, a contract position, um, those happen regu regularly. Um, what I think is an irritant to some people is certainly uh, the dollar amount uh, sounds high. And secondly, why the uh, contract was extended. Um, so there's a couple of elements out there. Because I'm on the board, I can't really get into of on the of the conversation around. But it was an agreement. Dave, is my guess, is there anything that, well, I mean, you've got a pretty good platform, but I mean, is there anything you want people to know about you or what you do that's been greatly misunderstood or misconstrued? Well, okay, I'm going to leave it this way. But, um, uh, anyway, sometimes we all speak on echo chambers, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, I've been uh, shifting my chamber lately it's been most painful and i can tell you that when you start to reassess everything you once believed because you don't believe that anymore painful so uh, i realized the echo chamber i came from and now i realize that i'm in a brand new one with new people and it's shockingly painful so that's my experience because i'm not happy i'm more social you know careful type of thing fiscally responsible and a great part of it, that narrative pretty, mm -hmm. pretty well for a long time. I don't think they do as much anymore, especially for that. Mm -hmm. I ran for the leadership in 2006. You haven't had experience. Yeah, you know, they haven't had a debate or conversation since. Forget an election, a contest. Wow. No, a Governing the most tech party in Canada. You get on interesting with whatever guys. I don't. Know. And someone says, "Are oh, you about book masturbation in the Queen's kids?" I don't care. They see Nazi at a local regional politician three or four times every time. Oh, That's my place. So I had this change, and, and so it, it's a shock for me to say to see a bear stand up at a regional council and for me to go. Way to go, man, because I hate you. I've hated you for a long time. You know, it doesn't change. So, but I have to put that away. I can't, I can't just behave for reasons. I suffer from the same thing everyone else does. But at the same time, uh, I'd like to be able to see even the guys that I make fun of mm -hmm. and be able to shake their hand and say, you know, I'm an asshole sometimes. You know, for me. Uh, well, so, I'm a political echo chamber, but. Uh, okay, like, so. 
what you what you hate and use your word is that and created a reference of himself and certain other people. Um, uh, and so that's you know, I'm having a conversation and being critical critical thinker. Uh, so quite frankly, I think you shine the example of I hope people who are becoming engaged start to do uh, then take things that value um, leaving way here read um, go a little further, you know, reach out I'm accessible. Um, which we have done in this case as well. So people like to go to people's camps. And it's so, um, and I think in the irritant that I I see myself as an independent legislature. Um and by the way, I said the reach everyone so the local council was on that you're with this person or you're with this person. It's too easy to people in camps and see the base of the world that way. You mentioned really issue by issue person. Um, the barometer for me always is a uh, for Um And uh, so that's where my decision making and behavior and priorities come from all the time. Uh, so there, there are other people who have different narratives. You know, that, say, there's 20% of people who always hate no matter what you say, 20% <laughs> will always love you no matter what you say. So I'm being into the rabbit's hole with the twenty percent of people. Um it's really I guess the whole distract taking deep talk about things today. Yeah. And it's counting they can you think about those things that are winning. So I think you gotta be careful of you know, acknowledging things and changing channel to things that you have right, still level at the local I just put I don't know his name. He's not at that meeting? I'm not. Yeah. have a 